Today we are talking about the famous Bertrand Russell and I, I forgot their names at the at the beginning of this. Copleton. Frederick Copleston. <laughs> yeah, Copleston. There's a there's a debate that these two guys had. Uh, they're they're both sort of famous, or they were famous back in the day for defending Christianity from Copleston's perspective. And uh, Bertrand Russell, very well known atheist, and they they had a debate back in 1948 that has become sort of famous because they talked about an, a, a very popular, I would say nowadays very popular argument for God called the argument from contingency, and they had a really good exchange on it. And a lot of the objections that Bertrand Russell raised in this dialogue, I think, I mean, I, I still see them today. Josh, I'm sure you could affirm this as well, is that some of his objections have sort of uh, stood the test of time, so to speak. There's atheists, I mean, uh, even uh, Alex O'Connor, cosmic skeptic, has sort of latched on to some of the objections that that Russell has given in this dialogue that they had back in 1948. So it's just a really cool. I mean, just apart from uh, you know all the content that was in this dialogue, it's just really cool that these ideas have had so much of an influence from this one little dialogue. And we're gonna see why it it's had such an impact and such influence. We're gonna see that. To, so let me uh, just set up how this stream is gonna go today. Then I'll let Josh introduce himself and then introduce the dialogue and uh, everything else. So we're, we're basically uh, the clip itself or like the because uh, it, it's actually a, a sort of part of a longer exchange that they had. They talked about this argument for about 15 to 18 minutes, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is we've split that 18 minutes into little sort of, sort of bite sized chunks. We're going to play the clips. Josh is going to provide some kind of analysis. We're going to have a little bit of back and forth. But the the hope here is that you're going to come away with this with a deeper appreciation for this dialogue, a better understanding of the ideas that that go on. Because, like, as you just listen to it, and I, I've listened to it a couple times at this point, as you just listen to it, it's kind of difficult. Like, some, some points start to just get really, really deep into the weeds, into the philosophy. And so it, it can be difficult to track sometimes. So that's why we wanted to... Uh, give this kind of analysis to help you as you're thinking through the objections yourself. So uh, with that said, just to give you uh, how this thing is going to run today, but Josh, give me a, or give the audience uh, an introduction to who you are. There's a reason why I have you on talking about this. Uh, mm -hmm. One of those reasons is that you're probably the world's foremost expert on the argument from contingency. And so that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have Josh on today to to do this with me. This is a long time coming actually too. We've uh, we had this scheduled what three or four times, and so it's yes. finally here. I'm so excited about it. So, Josh, tell the audience who you are, and then who I am. Yeah, let's let's get the dialogue started. Well, I like to let people know that I'm a person fundamentally. I'm also a philosopher, and as you say, Cameron, I have done uh, quite a bit of work on this kind of topic of of arguments from contingency, as well as some of the metaphysical conceptual frameworks um, underneath these arguments. So in this exchange, they're going to move through concept of concepts of necessity, of explanation, and they're going to talk about how these things play together, as well as the meanings of terms and propositions. And we'll be talking about these things. And I also wanted to point out, Cameron, I like what you said about how their exchange is kind of a bedrock exchange that then people are continuing to talk about. And in the literature on these topics, there's been quite a bit of progress that helps to clarify some of the things that go on in the exchange. It's very intense exchange, very quick. Um, they go from one thing to the next thing, and it'll be interesting to, to tease that out. But I think it is actually helpful to look at this exchange from the sort of lens of the contemporary literature or the contemporary understanding, which will, I think, help to clarify some things. But they do draw out some fundamental issues that are still alive in contemporary discussion. Yeah, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about before we actually started playing some of these clips is the fact that like if you listen to this dialogue, as someone who's like really really interested in this argument, uh, personally, I've got a I've got a, a deep appreciation and love for this topic. But like I go back and listen to this, and I'm like, they're they're still talking about stuff that's like relevant today and stuff that I've read, and it's just it's it's really cool to see that like how it's uh, it, it doesn't seem like you're listening to a debate that happened in 1948. It could have happened, you know, last year on YouTube. You just, it's its just really cool to, to see that. Yeah. So, yeah, Josh, yeah. how should we uh, set this up? So the first clip is actually just uh, starting with Copleston. He's sort of setting up his argument. And uh, sh is there anything else that you would like to say before we get into these clips? 
Well, I was just going to ask you, Cameron, about what what do you see is at stake? I sent you an email last night. Like, I want to get did, clear. Like, yeah. what's at stake in this um, debate? And I was thinking about this for myself when I was watching these these guys interact. I was thinking of these two sort of leaders and ideas coming head to head. And you know, on one level, you might think what's at stake is the quality of a certain argument, but I feel like there's more at stake here, having to do with how you can be powerful in the development of your worldview. There are more basic principles of how you make progress, even in the midst of a disagreement. How can you actually get a grip on something? And how, how can you get clear on something? So I'm thinking of something like that, that sort of tips to getting clear and become more powerful in your worldview development as being one of the things that's at stake. But what do you see, Cameron? What, what's at stake, do you think? Yeah, so that's a weirdly phrased question to me because I don't I don't really see anything as at stake here. I just see some some mm-hmm. like different goals of like why we would have a dialogue about this th- this dialogue that happened back in 1948. And one of those is that for someone like me who's just a layperson coming at this, you know, trying to understand things best I can, it can be tempting to sort of jump on the guy's side that that's on my side, the theist, the Christian, and be like, okay, yeah, this is a good argument because. Guy sounds pretty smart. Sounds like he knows what he's talking about. He's using some terms maybe I don't really understand completely, but it does seem like he knows what he's talking about. And so it can it can give the impression as someone like me, you know, that that's the the sort of bias coming in here is that seems like this good argument. Seems like uh, he's saying some things that I can get on board with. And so, you know, that that's one way to to sort of look at a dialogue like this. And it can happen on both sides. It's not just like Christians who do this as well. It's just bias can happen to anybody. So what I see as uh, sort of the value of having a dialogue about this is that when we slow down, we can really start to understand what's going on in a dialogue like this. And then it's going to help us, you know, as we critically think about ideas more generally in other areas, is that we can understand like this is this is something that you can do. It's it's sort of giving you guys a methodology for how to really think clearly about ideas and whether or not this is a good argument, whether or not. Someone has make a, you know, made a claim that's plausible or implausible. Uh, if on the face of it seems like this is a good argument, that, that, but then once you actually look a little bit deeper, parse things out a little bit more, maybe it's not as great of an argument as you thought it was. So that's the that's kind of the value that I see is that it's going to help people get or it's going to help to give people some some different tools in their sort of philosophical arsenal so they can yeah. better critique and understand arguments. But then also just the content of this argument itself. So like the argument from contingency, is this a good presentation of it? You know, mm-hmm. they had disagreements and everything. Uh, did Copleston actually win in the end? Were Russell's objections definitive? Did they sort of overcome Copleston's argument? So that's another thing is that like, what yeah. actually happened in this dialogue as yeah. it relates to the argument from contingency? Is there a winner? Is there not a winner? Uh, so th- th- those are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm, I see is valuable with a, a dialogue yeah. like this. Does that answer well, your ending, question? The ending is very interesting, you know, when we get to the, that last clip. And it's all the more interesting, I think, as you understand sort of what led to that last clip. So we'll, we'll see that when we get there. Okay, let's start with the first clip. And again, this is where Copleston is sort of setting up his argument. Uh, at the end of this clip, we'll come in and we'll try to provide some clarity on what he says. The first is I give a brief um statement and then we go on to discuss it well for clarity's sake i divide the argument <clears throat> into distinct stages uh, first of all i should say we know that there are at least some beings in the world which do not contain in themselves the reason for their existence for example i depend on my parents and now on the air on the food and so on now secondly the world is simply the real or imagined totality or aggregate of individual objects, none of which contain in themselves alone the reason of their existence. There isn't any world distinct from the objects which form it, any more than the human race is something apart from the members. Therefore, I should say, since objects or events exist, and since no object of experience contains within itself the reason of its existence, this reason, um, the totality of objects, must have a reason external to itself, and that reason must be an existent being. Well, this being is either itself the reason for its own existence, or it is not. If it is, well and good. If not, then we must proceed further. But if we proceed to infinity in that sense, then there's no explanation of existence at all. So, 
I should say, in order to explain existence, we must come to a being which contains within itself the reason for its own existence, that is to say, which cannot not exist. Okay, so this is the end of the first clip, and again, he's just sort of setting up the argument. So wh what would you like to say here to help clarify what, he's, what he said? Yeah, so I think it'd be good to just show the argument. I think you have a, a slide on that. Yeah. And then um, I was going to make some notes of clarifications on that argument. And then there's a another slide that says basically what he's saying in slightly simpler terms or perhaps clearer terms. Clearer uh, terms and also more contemporary, I think. Yeah, so that's right. that so there has been some progress that's been made on this argument, and one of those one of the the progresses one of, one of the, one of the ways points that this, of progress <laughs> points of progress has been made is that uh, some different terms have been used that are a little bit clearer, I think, and you'll see that once we get to the simplified version. So here's well, the original you know, version. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say I mean, one of the terms actually that has not been updated, but I learned from popular discourse um, that it should be updated for a popular presentation is the term being. So Cobbleson says, there are mm. some beings in the world. And I've noticed that when I've presented, when I've used that language in sort of a popular context, people always object. It's like, well, they think of being as a sentient being. And they say, well, you know, um, if your conclusion is that there's some sentient being, you haven't given an argument for that. But philosophers, we're, we're sort of weird in a way. We use terms in our own idiosyncratic ways. And when we use the term being in this context, we don't necessarily mean a sentient being, we just mean something. So so one of the clarifications is just to replace the word being with thing. And I've actually done this in my own work. Um, and earlier in my work, I used the philosopher's jargon, I used being, you know, sometimes we'll talk about a necessary being. Okay, a necessary being is a thing that is necessary, not necessarily um, a, a sentient being, apart okay. from additional arguments. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really helpful. Let's. Uh, I'll go ahead and put up Copleston's. Uh, and this is again. This is not. This is your sort of interpretation of what his argument looks like. Yeah. Okay. So th this is what I, I took to be um, his argument, and then there'll be the um, clarification version. So premise one: there are some beings in the world which do not contain within themselves the reason for their existence. The world is the totality of objects that don't contain within themselves the reason for their existence. There is a world. Okay. So objects exist. And then the next premise I put in here is just the linking premise so that we can get a valid argument where the conclusion follows from the premises. So I just say, if premises one through three are true, then there is something external to the world that contains within itself the reason for its existence. And then that's um, the conclusion at this point. Now later we'll see, he does say a few more things to draw out a little bit more about what kind of a thing this would be. Um, not much more, but a little bit more. So then we get the conclusion, therefore, there is something external to the world that contains within itself the reason for its existence. So that's the argument. Yeah, and to and me, it's not... Present, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, oh, well, let me let me give you guys this note, too. So I'm not going to have these arguments on the screen the whole time. Uh, but if you like, obviously, you can go back and pause and, and look at it a little bit further. Uh, but but I, I will have them on the screen for a while for you guys to, to look at. So uh, with, with that said, so these... This argument here, um, it's not entirely clear like where he's, it, it almost looks like he's just sort of asserting a whole bunch of things that in themselves may or may not seem plausible. And that's why I think it's so helpful that you've got the simplified version that I, to me, it's a whole lot easier to see, yeah, is this premise a good premise? Is this premise not? And uh, is, you know, is this premise true, I should say? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think the, the simplified version is, is very, very helpful. So would you like to, to say anything yeah. before we... Put that uh, one up. No, go ahead and you can show the, the simplified one. Okay. Yeah. So I take this to be really the the um, the bones of the argument. So the first premise is that there are dependent things. What's a dependent thing? It's just something that depends on something else. So if something's dependent, it can only exist if there's something else upon which it depends. And at this point, we can leave open how it depends on something else. It could depend by being caused by something else. It could be dependent by being grounded in something else, or maybe there's some way of explaining it in terms of something else. Um, but we just leave that open. And then the totality of dependent things is dependent. And he'll come back to this premise later in their exchange, where he, he basically makes the argument that 
adding up dependent things won't yield an independent thing. If those premises are true, then there is an independent thing. And there's more, there's more to say in support of that second premise that he gives, um, which we'll see later. So then premise four. Yeah, I also want to point out real yeah. quick that premise three doesn't follow logically from one and two. That's the, that's the reason that you've actually got it here as a premise. So if one and two, then there is an independent thing. This is still a premise, even though I think it's undeniable. I think that it's sort of important to point that out. Yeah. Just to make that explicit. So number four, if something is independent, then it has within itself the reason for its existence. And here, the implicit premise is a principle of sufficient reason or some kind of principle of explanation, where everything has a reason or explanation of its existence, either within itself or um, not within itself, within another. And this is actually a key premise. He, he says these things don't have an explanation within themselves, um, you might even think this is implicit in premise two, like the dependent things don't have an explanation within themselves and adding up things that don't have an explanation within themselves only yield something, a total, that still uh, doesn't have an explanation wholly within itself. And then therefore it has to have an explanation within something else. Well, well, why think that? Well, the implicit premise is that it has to have some explanation either within itself or within something else. I remember when I was first reading William Rowe on this uh, in his work on cosmological arguments, and he points out, he, he, he makes explicit this implicit premise. Sometimes cer certain arguments are given from explanation and it's not made explicit. Once you make it explicit, then you can ask, okay, well, is it true that everything has an explanation either within itself or not? Um, and so then from those premises, you get that there is something that has within itself the reason for its existence, something then that provides the explanation of everything else. So this is the root of reality. It exists sort of by its own nature, and then everything else exists ultimately dependent on it. That's the idea. Yeah, and and again, having it in those terms was just a whole lot easier for, for me to follow. It was also really cool to see that there's an implicit premise here, which I didn't catch when I first listened to this, but then when you actually sort of, sort of break it down, yeah, there is an implicit premise here, which, which again, can go toward this purpose of like showing you, showing showing anybody that there's sometimes when we give an argument or make a statement, there's something implicitly that we're assuming as part of our argument that if we made that explicit, that's another point of, uh, that's another area where someone could sort of disagree. So it's just, it's really helpful to, to see that sort of drawn out explicitly. Yeah. So the next clip we've got, and Josh, let me know if you'd like to say anything before we go to it, is Russell's response to uh yeah. to this setup of the argument i think we can go ahead to the response sounds good okay so here we go here's uh the next clip from bertrand russell this uh, raises a great many points and it's not altogether easy to know where to begin but i think that perhaps in answering your argument the best point with which to begin is the question of a necessary being the word necessary I should maintain, can only be applied significantly to propositions and, in fact, only to such as are analytic, that is to say, such as it is self-contradictory to deny. I could only admit a necessary being if there were a being whose existence it is self-contradictory to deny. Uh, I should uh, like to know whether you would accept Leibniz's division of propositions into truths of reason and truths of fact. The former, the truths of reason, being necessary. So tell me what's going on here. What is what has uh, Russell just done? Yeah, so many of your listeners may recognize a kind of Swinburnian uh, move here. So... People who know Swinburne's work know that he's sort of famous for arguing that God doesn't have necessary existence in the strongest sense of necessary existence, which he takes to be a kind of logical necessary existence. And a logical necessary existence would be existence that you can deduce just by logic, just by truths of reason alone. And so Russell is, is picking up on the same kind of idea. Um, part of what he's doing is he's trying to get clear on what this term necessary means. And he's thinking that we understand the term necessary in terms of truths of reason. So truths of reason, like one plus one equals two, 
that's necessary. Whatever you can deduce from truths of reason, those are necessary. And so if, uh, if something's necessary, then the proposition that it doesn't exist needs to actually be self-contradictory. And by self-contradictory, this means that it entails a contradiction. It doesn't necessarily mean a contradiction is explicit in it. Um, for example, one plus one equals three. You might think that's self-contradictory, but it doesn't have the form of a contradiction of A and not A, but it would entail a contradiction. And so what Russell is, is uh, worried about is the very, well, it's interesting because in my notes, I talk about how the, these guys, they often have these indirect replies to each other. Instead of directly engaging with the argument, they have an argument against the conclusion. So here, Russell doesn't object any premise in Copleston's argument. He doesn't say, oh, well, it's premise two. That's my problem. I, I have reason to doubt that. Instead, he's getting underneath the whole argument. At, at, um, he's getting to the root of the argument saying, look, your conclusion can't be true. Like, there's got to be something wrong with your argument because your conclusion is that there's something that has necessary existence. But that means that there's something such that denying it would entail a contradiction. But that can't be. There, there's Truths of reason are inadequate to reveal that something exists. Reason alone doesn't tell us that anything is, is, exists. And so I actually formulated his idea here in an argument. Um, so I'm just going to share the argument. Premise one, the term necessary means that it is self-contradictory to deny it. A thing is necessary only if it is self-contradictory to deny, to deny that it exists by the definition. There is no, no thing such that it is self-contradictory to deny that it exists. Therefore, there is no thing such that it has necessary existence. So that's the argument against the conclusion of Copleston's argument. And, uh, and this, so that's basically what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. Go and ahead. so premise one here, the term necessary means that it is self-contradictory to deny it. Is is this what he's saying is just falls out of the meaning of the term yes. necessary? Yes. Yeah. And so we'll see how Copleston responds to this. But I did have just a few more notes I want to share about this because um, even in, even at this point, and I just want to say that this is a classic objection, and it, it does still show up in contemporary times. Somebody, a philosopher, actually sent me an email where he said that this was his objection to arguments from contingency, that they imply that there's a necessary thing, but it's like a category mistake. Necessity doesn't apply to things. Necessity applies to propositions, truths of reason, not to things. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the notes is that, I already kind of mentioned this, but it's actually really important, so it's a key, so that we don't run ahead beyond what reason reveals. And that is to distinguish between an explicit contradiction that's contained in the sentence and a contradiction that's entailed by it. And sometimes there can be contradictions that people don't see. Um, you know, it's not as though Russell gave an argument that has its has as its conclusion that there is nothing such that its denial is not contradictory. He just says that. He just asserts that. You know, and you might wonder, well, why think that's true? Maybe it is true, but why think that is true? Um, in my notes, I have what I call the dissertation challenge. This, you could like write a dissertation uh, trying to answer the following question. Can you deduce from pure reason that it is impossible to deduce from pure reason that something exists or even that something concrete exists? You know, that that's the challenge. And this is something that Richard Swinburne has done some work towards that challenge. But it's an open challenge. It's, it's not like it's just, you know, oh, you just point out there's no contradiction and then you move on. It's like, well, let, we have to see that there's no way to deduce a contradiction. And if I could just add one more point here about this, in my view, it is actually possible to see that something exists just by reason. Now, this is controversial, but I think it's possible to see that there are prime numbers by reason. Um, for example, I think that it's a principle of reason that there are prime numbers between 2 and 10. And then from there, I can deduce uh, if there are prime numbers between 2 and 10, there are prime numbers. Therefore, there are prime numbers. And that term, there are... What I mean by that is um, there, that there are, that, that there really are, that there exist prime numbers. And I think that I can see this by reason. And this would be a way of, of motivating the idea that, well, at least there's something such that denying its existence, prime numbers, 
will implicitly entail a contradiction. It will contradict a truth of reason. So that opens the door to the in principle project of deducing uh, a contradiction from denying the existence of certain things. Now you might think, well, those are abstract things, abstract numbers. God is supposed to be a concrete thing. Well, just last week I gave a talk at a conference for Brazil where I showed a few different strategies for deducing a contradiction from denying even the existence of concrete things. Um, you know, and, and part of it is that you, when you deny the existence of something, then you can deduce that it's true that that thing doesn't exist. But then there's this question of, okay, well, how can that be true? How can there be something that's true unless there's something that exists? The truth itself implies existence. And so there are, there are some moves here that can go from pure reason to the existence of something. My goal here isn't to try to defend those moves or anything, but just to point to them and just to say there is an open challenge um, with respect to deducing the existence of something just from reason alone. Does that make sense, Cameron? Yeah, I also wanted to point out that in the past I've heard you talk about this objection like, you know, necessity can mean a whole lot of different things. So one one thing that it could mean is this very, very, I don't know if you want to call it a narrow or broad definition of necessity, but there's just, there's, there's different, I'll just use another philosophical term here. There's different modalities of necessity. So there's different ways to understand the sort of scope of what is necessary. And so in this sense, you know, you could say that whatever is necessary, it's got it to entail, uh, or if it's false, it's got to entail a contradiction or something, something like that. Like that's a very, very strong view of what yeah. necessity is, but there's different kinds of necessity. I heard you talk about this in your, uh, your dialogue with Scott Clifton that there's, and this is, I think a uh, part of your response to Richard Swinburne as well, is that there's just, there's mm -hmm. different kinds of necessity. And maybe for the argument from contingency, you don't need this really, really strong view of necessity. You could, uh, you could take maybe a weaker view that's still going to have this argument or have this uh, conclusion from the argument from contingency. Uh, even if you don't have this really strong s sort of necessity that, that these other people have in mind. So I wanted to see if you could uh, comment on that. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, this is exactly what Copleston is going to say next, right? And this is the standard response. Um, the standard response is to distinguish between these notions of necessity. And so this is perhaps the best time then to play the next clip. All right, let's do it. Here we go. I certainly should not subscribe to what seems to be Leibniz's idea of truth and reason and truth of fact, since it would appear that for him there are in the long run only analytic propositions. I don't want to uphold the whole philosophy of Leibniz. I have made use of his argument from contingent to necessary being, basing the argument on the principle of sufficient reason, simply because it seems to me a brief and clear formulation of what is the, in my opinion, the fundamental metaphysical argument for God's existence. Yeah, so here he, he takes the line that you just pointed to, Cameron, and he distinguishes uh, and, and they're going to continue uh, to go back and forth on this because this is really a key to clarifying the argument. How do you understand necessity? I mean, this is really fundamental. It's like really, really important. But he makes a distinction between what you might call metaphysical necessity and just pure logical necessity. Um, and so metaphysical necessity, you can just think of that as just, it just it's metaphysically necessary if it cannot not be. Um, now, how do you understand that notion of cannot not be? Well, we're going to explore that a bit as we continue through the clips, because there is a question about whether you can understand that apart from a kind of logical necessity. But I think at this point, just for everybody watching, it's helpful to clarify the difference between a kind of epistemic notion, which is a notion based on what you can sort of see or know with your mind through reason, versus an ontological notion, which has to do with the nature of things. So the question is, is it part of the nature of reality that there's something that just cannot not be? Uh, some people have thought that that um, the sort of foundational layer of existence cannot not be. And that if it could not be, then it would call for deeper explanation to account for why does it be rather than not. The deepest thing cannot not be, it just exists in a robust way. Um, or you might think, for example, uh, abstract objects or logical truths. You might think that it's not just that they're necessary in, ep in an epistemic sense that you can see that they're necessary because even if you couldn't see that they're necessary you might think that they also have this kind of 
ontological grip uh, on existence that that the, the the laws of logic just cannot not be they cannot not be true and they cannot not exist in order to be true um, so that that's just a really key distinction there and I have in my notes if I could add one more thing is a key point which is that whether or not real ontological necessity is also logical necessity that is to say whether or not you can also know that metaphysical necessities are true by reason because maybe you can maybe every metaphysical necessity can be known by reason but whether you can or can't you can still separate the basic concept of metaphysical necessity from the epistemic concept in fact it seems to me that the epistemic concept of necessity you couldn't even grasp this epistemic logical concept of deducing a contradiction unless you already had a prior grasp of this more basic metaphysical concept the epistemic concept is built out of the more basic concept of necessity because to say that p doesn't entail a contradiction to say that is to say that necessarily full stop no one could by any principle of reason whether that principle is known or unknown deduce a contradiction like that's what it means to be able to deduce a contradiction um, so it's, it's basically the, the main point here is that there's this more basic concept of necessity that is prior to I think even our epistemic concept of necessity and then if, if that's right you can articulate this argument from contingency in terms of that basic metaphysical concept so I I'm gonna have to have you uh, just boil this down for me and for the audience what is another way of understanding the way that Copleston is responding to this I, I'd like to get some some clarity on the, maybe the different types of necessity that we're we're talking about here so uh, the one that Russell is talking about the really strict one I think you have it here in your notes as like truth of reason yeah right strong logical notion of necessity so what does that what does that mean let's unpack that and then we'll turn to metaphysical necessity and then epistemic necessity yeah something that you can just see to be true just by reasoning and i think examples always help you know i can just see that if something is wholly red then it's not also wholly blue um you might think that's because if it were wholly blue being wholly blue entails not being red well that very mm -hmm. entailment i think you can see by reason and also i think you can see by reason that something can't be both red and not red because that would be contradictory and you can see by reason that something can't be contradictory um, so those would be principles of reason so this is this is starting to remind because i'm actually going to interview uh, a guy next week his name is jc beale and he's uh he's got a new book out called the contradictory christ where he argues that christianity entails a contradiction but it entails a true contradiction so he thinks that mm -hmm. contradictions are possible and it's a it's a minority view obviously there's uh there's only a i would say a handful and maybe you know the the more accurate statistic here but uh, there are some people who allow for the possibility of contradictions. And so what this sort of, this whole conversation, at least the, this part of the conversation, I'll say, is, uh, is sort of tying into this other thing that I've been thinking about for a little while, is that uh, when we're thinking about, like, how do we actually structure what is logically possible? Or what yeah. what does logic permit, so to speak? And it's, it's a different question between, like, what are the different possibilities? That's one question. And another question is, well, what's true? You know, this is possible, but then what's true? And so we can sort of distinguish here between the setting up the the sort of scope of yeah. everything that would be possible. And if you think that contradictions are possible, then you'd be in that camp. You'd say that, yeah, yeah. contradictions can be possible. And just, you know, maybe in some cases that's what we have. Uh, but then there's a separate question of like, well, how do we actually get at truth? How do we know when there is, say, a true contradiction, if you think contradictions are possible? How do we get to just the truth of any uh, sort of mundane proposition? So there's a difference between logical possibility and truth. I, that's one distinction I want to make. But then also yeah. I just want to talk about like, are we assuming like a certain structure of how logical possibility works here? And uh, if so, like how does that work? How do we actually get there? And that, that kind of dips into the second thing I was just talking about, like how do we get at the truth? And uh, I think it actually even applies in this area. How do we get to the truth of what's logically possible? So it's yeah. just, uh, it's really confusing to me 
as someone who obviously is coming at this from my perspective as a layperson. But yeah, let's let's maybe talk about that for a little bit. How do we know what's logically possible? How do we know? Because that's that's I think one of the things that uh, Russell is assuming here is that these sort of contradictory statements are not logically possible. Uh, but you know, some philosophers deny that. Some so yeah, let's let's talk about that for yeah, a little bit. Yeah, what is the, that, that's a nice what is the logic because, of logic? Yeah, you don't have to. Um, a principle doesn't have to be uncontroversial for it to be true. And even for it to be known to be true, um, it sort of happens to be like every everything is sort of controversial under, under the sun, right? It doesn't mean you can't know anything. Um, so, you know, I, I like your point here because you don't have to believe that there can't be any true contradictions to believe that something can't be uh, green and not green at the same time. Um, you can consider the specific case something is mm -hmm. green and not green. And reason can just reveal to you that that just seems impossible. Um, now, you might also think in general there can't be contradictions. That it might also seem impossible. But then there's some interesting paradoxes that the liar paradox. Might, might, yeah, sort of might weigh on the other side of your mind. And so then you might be unsure about the, the more general or the more ambitious principle. But the, the big point here is, and I just like want people to be encouraged by this, is that like you don't have to resolve all the controversy over all the candidate principles of reason for there to be principles of reason for there to be mm -hmm. truths revealed by reason and um i think that's just an important point um and the, the other thing that i think is helpful is to think about maybe possibilities in terms of concentric circles so um if something is um, say logically possible it's consistent with the principles of reason you might think of that as like a big circle of possibility Mm -hmm. And then you might wonder, okay, well, um, maybe it's consistent with the principles of reason, um, but is it also um, just possible full stop? Um, like, so maybe there are some possibilities, uh, oh, let me put it this way, maybe there are some impossibilities that are consistent with the principles of reason, but you just can't see that they're impossible by reason. Um, an example sometimes people give would be water is not H2O. You might think it's sort of consistent with the principles of reason that water is not H2O. You can't deduce a contradiction from water is not H2O, you might think. Um, but you might think that, in fact, water is H2O, and by the necessity of identity, it cannot not be H2O. So it's actually necessary that water is H2O, and it's not even possible that it's not H2O, even if it's logically possible. So yeah, there's... Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm definitely tracking with that. I'm just trying to figure out if there's another way to uh, to set that up. But I, I fear I fear that we're getting a little bit too deep into the weeds. Uh, I just wanted to provide some clarity on like what's yeah. what's going on here. We're, right now, there's a discussion between Copleston and uh, and Russell on the nature of necessity. That's basically what's happening here, and that's the the name of a book that you actually got in your notes. Why don't you mention that really really quickly? Oh yeah, so for people um, who want to get is. deeper into the subject. The, so I, I've read a number of books on modality. Um, Alexander Proust has a book on modal modality having to do with the nature of possibility and necessity. Um, Alvin Plantinga has a classic book, The Nature of Necessity. And I've personally found his book to be the most helpful in clarifying these distinctions. So I, I would highly recommend um, The Nature of Necessity. Alex's book right. is also worth, worth checking out too. So should we say anything else before we uh, set up the, new, uh, the next clip? I think we're ready to go. The big thing I want to just say is that they're going to continue to talk about this notion of necessity because it's such a key. Mm -hmm. And the next two clips are on that. So if you want to show the next one, and then we could pause, or you could even just show the next two if you'd like. We can just see how, how, how that looks. We'll pause uh, for just a second after the third, and then, yeah, we'll see where we go from Sounds there. Good. All right, here we go. Here's the, the next clip uh, response from Bertrand Russell. But to my mind, a necessary proposition has got to be analytic. I don't see what else it can mean. And analytic propositions are always complex and logically somewhat late. Rational animals are animals is an analytic proposition. But a proposition such as this is an animal can never be analytic. Well, in fact, all the propositions that can be analytic are somewhat late in the build-up of propositions. 
Yeah. Do you have anything that you'd like to add here before we play the next well, one? Maybe, yeah, maybe I will say, you know, within truths of reason, sometimes people will divide between analytic truths of reason, which are like truths that are uh, just by definition, like rational animals are by definition animals, you know, an or another way of thinking about it is uh, the very concept of a rational animal already includes the concept of animal. So you can just sort of see it, um, uh, you know, just in the concept of it versus another kind of truth of reason, which isn't just true by definition. It's not just true by conceptual inclusion. Um, and so sometimes this is called uh, a, a kind of synthetic, it's not analytic, it's a synthetic truth of reason or synthetic a priori truth of reason. Um, I myself don't think that this distinction between analytic and synthetic truths of reason uh, really carves anything at the joints. I mean, because in, in camera, I know we've talked about this online um, about how you define analytic, but take rational animals are animals. Okay, well, it's true that rational animals are animals includes, uh, rational animal includes the concept of animal, but sort of the, the, the uh, implicit assumption here is this conjunctive elimination rule where uh, if you have something of the form A and B, then that entails uh, A. So A and B entails A. Okay, but, but why think that's true, right? Like why think that A and B entails A? I think the difficulty here is that to even ask the question feels almost embarrassing. Like, why are you asking that, Josh? Like, isn't it just obvious? Well, yeah, it is obvious. Like by reason, you can just see that it, you know, a and B entails A. You can just sort of see that. Um, but, I mean, it's not just true by definition. It's not true by definition of the terms. It's true by a more basic principle of reason that you can see. So as far as I can tell, this distinction between the sort of analytic truths and other a priori truths kind of comes down to a certain set of privileged um, principles that are just very obvious, like conjunction, uh, the, this sort of conjunction principle, and that um, you, you might think of them as kind of syntactic principles, that it's just you, you syntactically manipulate symbols to get the output. But I don't think it is syntactic because you can define your language in different ways, and what remains are these just basic principles. So um, it sounds like all, yeah, it yeah. sounds like you're uh, you're talking about the concept of an axiom. So like, yeah. what is your like basis or like your fundamental? What are your fundamental principles that you start from that are sort of the basis for all the other things that you get out of your s sort of system? And so one of the, I mean, in mathematics, obviously you've got some mathematical axioms that a lot of these like more complex equations depend on these sort of more fundamental mathematical axioms. But in logic, it's sort of the same principle. And I think that may be what you're pointing at here is that you've got this sort of set of fundamental logical axioms, so to speak, that you start from, but those axioms themselves, how do you see that those axioms are true? Exactly. And I think yeah. part of your point is just that when it comes to like the most fundamental stuff, it, you just see it by reason. It's like A plus B entails A equals A. Like yeah. that's just what you, you can see that that's, that's one of your, the, the axioms that, you know, any reasonable person can just see. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, I mean, sometimes people will say that a set of axioms is a kind of implicit definition. It's a way of sort of defining the terms, but embedded in the understanding of that definition are going to be these bedrock principles of reason that you just see um, th th these, these relations between ideas that you can just see to be true in your mind. I mean, even modus ponens, like if A is true and if A implies B, in other words, if A is true and if A is true, then B is true, then B is, then B is true. That feels like a, a valid inference there. And sometimes I'll ask my students, well, how do you know that that's valid? How do you know that if A is true and A implies B is true, then B is true? How do you know that? Well, now we're just, we're, we're kind of at the bedrock. That, you know, and, and if you did appeal to other principles of reason to deduce a principle of reason, then these other principles would be the axioms. So at some point you just have these basic principles that you can just see to be true. They don't have to be uncontroversial we talked about this already. There could be controversy over what is true, um, but just that it is possible to see that they're true. So then uh, I think I've got a way of summarizing what Russell's response was, and then we're about to turn to Copleston's response to the response. So Russell says that he doesn't understand metaphysical necessity 
unless it's understood. Um, and I'm basically just reading your notes here, but it just sort of a light bulb went off unless it's understood in terms of truths of reason. And so if you okay. can't see it by your light of reason, by the light of reason that leads you to, you know, accept that a plus B equals a or entails a, uh, if you can't do that, then you can't get to this metaphysical necessary notion of a God, right? Because you've got to be able to see it just by reason alone, but reason alone doesn't get us there. That's sort of what Russell is getting at. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Reason alone can't get you there. So that's basically Russell's response. And then Copleston yeah. has a, a really genius response to that. He does. If I could just say, one of the things that I've been wanting to say, and this is not what Copleston says, is I just want to slow down this argument and just say, you know, Russell, it's still a further question. It's like a dissertation question, whether reason can get you there, whether you can just by the light of reason deduce the existence of a necessary thing. Um, but that is stronger than what Copleston wants to say. And um, he, he wants to say that, no, we can understand the concept of necessity apart from this kind of logical deduction. Right. Right. Yep. So, yeah, this, we're going to let me go ahead and play this clip and then we'll we'll keep talking. Take the proposition, if there is a contingent being, then there is a necessary being. I consider that that proposition, hypothetically expressed, is a necessary proposition. If you are going to call every necessary proposition an analytic proposition, then in order to avoid a dispute in terminology, I will agree to call it analytic, though I don't consider it a tautological proposition. But the proposition is a necessary proposition, only on the supposition that there is a contingent being. That there is a contingent being actually existing has to be discovered by experience. And the proposition that there is a contingent being is certainly not an analytic proposition. Though once you know, I should maintain, that there is a contingent being, it follows of necessity that there is a necessary being. I just have to say, what, what I love about the way they, they're replying to each other is that they they always target each other's conclusion and the replies are already, <laughs> they're always indirect. So he doesn't say, you know what, Russell, um, your definition of analytic, your definition of necessity isn't true, isn't the right definition. Here's a different definition. I mean, he kind of explores that. But instead he says, I'll grant you, like, let's just call this analytic if we want to. But then by reason, we can deduce there has to be something that is necessary. But then he makes the point that, I mean, in a way, Coppleson agrees with with uh, Russell on this, that it isn't just a matter of reason that there are contingent things, but he thinks that it is a matter of reason that if there are contingent things, then there would have to be an explanation of those contingent things in terms of a necessary thing. So so it's kind of interesting how, how Coppleson is basically arguing that there has to be a necessary truth uh, the proposition that this thing is necessary has to be a necessary truth and we can get yeah. there through experience yeah so i think copleston is wanting to avoid this like whole semantic thing that russell is doing he wants to just like get back to the argument he wants to like do away That's with this it. objection be like okay let's just like accept that we're talking about this def or this understanding of of necessity in in any case my argument still follows and in any case we still need experience in order to know that a contingent thing exists so like he's he's trying to get back to like the most plausible parts of his argument and show that even if Russell's definition is true, we can still get there. We can still get to the conclusion that I want. Yeah, or ultimately there has to be something wrong with what Russell is saying because I mean it, it's sort of tricky. It's, it's like we can see that there is something and we can <laughs> see that if there's something there has to be something necessary. Um so there's got to be something know. wrong with what he's saying, yeah. Yeah. So it's it, like you say, it's it's a very indirect reply, but it's also just yes. it's brilliant that these guys. And obviously, we're stopping the clips like after someone talks, we're stopping and then we're letting the other person sort of give their response, and then we're talking about it. But they were doing this like real time. I don't understand how they were able to like give this or have a, a level of dialogue like this just real time. So it's it's crazy. like a chess match where they they knew all the yeah. moves already, and so. They didn't explore this path. They already knew how that went. So they're like playing the, like speed chess. That that's that was like a metaphor I had when I was watching this. Like, okay, mm -hmm. they, they knew that move. That was clever. Indirect reply back, indirect reply back. And um, so, yeah, we're slowing it down to to really explore the other possible moves and, you know, why why they went this way rather than another way. I mean, I do think Coppleston could have explored the path of deducing existence just through pure reason. But that 
that's an unnecessary path. And that path goes into many, many weeds of complexity. Um, mm -hmm. So he took a, a straighter path just to say, no, we can understand the concept of necessity without truth of reason. Russell replies, he doesn't think that's true. Then Cobbleson replies, uh, well, okay, but we can argue then that there has to be a necessary thing that back from my original argument. You haven't said anything wrong with that original argument, you know, because the replies were only indirect. And uh, yeah, so the next part uh, really draws out sort of why the meaning of the term is at stake. If you want to play the next term uh, video. Okay, here's the next clip. The difficulty of this argument is that I don't admit the idea of a necessary being, and I don't admit that there is any particular meaning in calling other beings contingent. These phrases don't, for me, have a significance, except within a logic that I reject. A contingent being is a being which has not in itself the complete reason for its existence. That's what I mean by a contingent being. You know as well as I do that the existence of neither of us can be explained without reference to something or somebody outside us, our parents, for example. The necessary being, on the other hand, means a being that must and cannot not exist. You may say that there is no such being, but you will find it hard to convince me that you do not understand the terms I am using. If you do not understand them, then how can you be entitled to say that such a being does not exist, if that is what you do say? Yeah, it's really clever there at the at the very end. Yeah, I, I like that question. Like, how, how can you even say that there is no necessary thing if you don't even understand what that term means? Although I suppose what Russell's going to say, he does understand what it means in terms of truths of reason, but he doesn't have another understanding of it. Um, so what he's really saying is that there is no thing such that denying it entails a contradiction. One thing here that... Uh, I have in my notes is about whether Coppleston is equivocating on the use of the term contingent. So Coppleston defines contingent as doesn't contain the complete reason for its existence. And then he defines a necessary thing as something that cannot not exist. Well, in discussions of arguments from contingency, that term contingent is normally defined as something that can not exist. And then something that's necessary is something that cannot not exist. Um, so if it's contingent, then it's not necessary. But the way Cobbleston defines it, he says it's something, a contingent thing is something that doesn't contain the complete reason for its existence. And then, of course, there's that implicit premise there that if it doesn't contain the reason for its, its existence, then there has to still be a reason for its existence. That's the premise, that contingent things have a reason. And so therefore, the reason for its existence has to be external to it in terms of something that's not contingent and therefore something that's necessary. I think that one could charge Coppleston of equivocating on the term contingent, using it to mean doesn't contain the reason for its existence on the one hand, but also using it to mean something that can fail to be or can not exist. Um, my charitable interpretation of what's going on here is that Coppleston thinks there's a cluster of concepts that mutually entail each other by reason. So that he's thinking that if something's contingent in the way he defines it, then given this principle of explanation, it's going to have to depend on something um, external to itself. Um, yeah, so, I, I also picked yeah. up on the fact that, that that was a weird definition of contingent to me, because I'm, I'm used to the more contemporary yeah. usages of these terms and contingent in the way that you and I use it. Uh, well, really, there's there's two different ways that contingent is used in the contemporary literature. One of them is in the dependent sense. So like something, yeah. and I think that's also the colloquial sense. So like when someone says the term contingent in a non-philosophical context, they're really yeah. thinking about something as dependent on something else. Like mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, your house is contingent, something like that means it depends on something else. So the dependent uh, view or the, def the dependent usage of the term is one of the, one of the uh, usages that's out there. Uh, but the the more common one, I think the the one that I'm super familiar with and the one that I use more more often in the argument from contingency is the definition of X can fail to exist. So something is contingent if it's possible that it doesn't exist. And everything in our experience, uh, pretty much everything I say, unless you think that you've experienced a necessary being or God. Uh, so it, it, everything in our experience, like a, my 
everything in my office. I'll say that my camera, my computer, my lights, the bookshelves behind me, all that stuff can fail to exist, can go out of existence. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I wanted to just say that uh, Copleston's definition here seems a little bit out of line with uh, the way that these terms are used contemporarily. And also it could have led to some uh, confusion on Russell's part here is that he just, uh, like you said, maybe he was using the terms in different ways. Um, but nevertheless, you know, that, that's, that's sort of aside from what he says at the very end here, which was super genius. He's like, how can you say that there are no necessary beings if you don't know what that term means? And uh, yeah. I thought that was just super clever. That was a clever idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it really matters how you define the terms because right. if you define contingent as dependent, and then you have your argument for there's something that's independent, that's the source of the dependent things, then it's a further question whether the independent thing has necessary existence. Um, because, right, because maybe it's independent, um, but it also can fail to be. It's contingent in the contemporary sense. Uh, that's why I want to just be careful not to equivocate on those terms. I think just the, my charitable interpretation is that once you get to something independent, He's going to argue that it has necessary existence because that's the only way that it could have the reason for its existence within its own nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so going going back to like Russell's start of his objection was all about this like analytic synthetic distinction. He's saying that only analytic truths can be necessary truths. And then when it comes to a necessary being, it's just it, it's not a an analytic truth that there is a necessary being. And then Copleston came back. He's like, no, yeah, yeah, that, my argument actually does get you that to that conclusion. Um, so, but yeah, so going going back to uh, what Russell's point was, and I think Copleston maybe was trying to just sort of sidestep it again, was like, let's not get bogged down into the terminology here. Let's try to get back to it. And he's like, you know, I've got the, the, the term contingent seems like a pretty straightforward term to understand and, you know, if you say that you don't understand it, then how can you say that you don't admit this concept in reality? It's just kind of a weird thing to do. So it's just, it's, it's been a super fun exchange so far. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's so get on to the next clip. clip. Continues. It, it continues. This is the final clip on defining terms. And, and I, I actually, just a little anecdote on defining terms. I was um, uh, talking with, uh, let's see, it was Peter Vanenwagen, Alexander Proust, and Richard Swinburne. Uh, we, they were, and me, and we, we were just having lunch, and we talked about this argument, uh, the argument from contingency. And our conversation moved quickly to this exact issue that we're talking about right now, how you define these terms. Um, because, you know, Richard Swinburne was talking about how to define necessity in terms of truths of reason. And then the three of us, Peter Van Wagen, Bruce, and I were objecting in various ways. But then it tur it transformed into a conversation not just about the meaning of necessity Cameron it turned into a conversation about the meaning of meaning and I I just kind of like <laughs> back in the conversation I'm like this is typical <laughs> you know, like, we can't make progress until we define things all the way out um, you know and that can be a problem but I think actually in the end it does make you way more powerful in your own understanding if you do that work to clarify all the terms all the way out I've had something that I wanted to talk about for a while. And so I, I, I don't know of a better time to bring it up. I'll just bring it up now. So I've, yeah. I've always had the impression that like someone like Richard Swinburne, who argues that, you know, that the proposition God exists is not an analytic truth because, you know, God does not exist. That doesn't seem like it's analytic either. And so when you have an analytic truth or you have a necessary truth, it's got to entail uh, or the falsity of that proposition has to entail a contradiction. So, yeah. but to, in my mind, it, it, it seems like we're sort of begging the question here because if God is a metaphysically necessary being, then mm -hmm. the proposition God exists is going to entail the proposition God exists and God cannot not exist, something something like that. And so it may not seem, and this is why I think it's important to, to really understand that what's implicit behind a proposition or what a proposition entails is important too, but it almost just seems to me like people who object in this way are just assuming that there can't be any metaphysically necessary beings or a things, you know, there can't be an, a metaphysically necessary thing. But to yeah. me, it's like, or even that, it, even that there can't be a logically necessary thing. I mean, even, even just turn the dial all the way to the strongest concept of necessity we can imagine. Um, it still takes yeah, a little because bit more if, work. Because if the thing in question is just the type of being that has that kind of necessity, yes. then it's part of the concept itself. 
that entails that it's a necessary thing. And you might not think that there are any of those beings, yeah. but that doesn't entail that there can't be, you know, sort of coherently a kind of being like that. So that to me, it just seems like it's it's sort of begging the question. You're you're assuming that there can't be any beings of that sort of the category necessary being. And it, it just doesn't like do anything for me, because if there is a type of being like that, that has that kind of necessity, then there is going to be it is going to tell it entail a contradiction if that thing doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it's begging the question if you assume it without motivating your assumption now in support of of Richard, he does try to motivate this. I mean, he has this principle that um, the mere non-existence of something, whether it's a rock or a god, can never entail the existence of something. And in the most recent iteration of his, his argument that I've seen, um, he tries to mo motivate this in kind of a, a soft way where he, he motivates it by example. You know, it's like this principle of what do we want to call it, you know, this sort of existential principle that denying something doesn't entail its existence um, is supported by like lots and lots of examples and there's no obvious counterexample to it. So, you know, now it's a kind of defeasible principle. Um, and I think, you but know, to so, me, so there's some room. Yeah. We're still getting, we're still getting deep. We're going even deeper now. And uh, I apologize to the audience if we've, uh, we've already lost you, but stick around. We're about to, to hop back into the exchange. They're, but, they're uh, following. Get, You've got a smart audience, Cameron. Well, so, okay, so... Uh, they know what we're doing. <laughs> it's, I mean, it seems to me like that's just like, we're, we're just in super controversial territory at this point. Because if you want to say that the non-existence of something doesn't entail the existence of that thing, I mean, because uh, to my understanding, when we're dealing with um, a conditional proposition, so like if X or if P then Q, you know, that's a conditional proposition. But if uh, the antecedent P is impossible you know and and so uh, again going back to yeah. what i was just saying like if there is yeah. such a being as as god who has this kind of necessity then the antecedent that being doesn't exist god does not exist is impossible and yeah. on the standard semantics it just entails everything it there's a sort of explosion principle that happens yeah, yeah. Yeah. and so it seems like that's going to be super controversial like it doesn't seem to me like that obviously helps the case or leads us into less controversial waters. seems like, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's definitely still controversial, especially since you have an independent argument for the existence of a necessary thing. And it's a further question whether you want to tighten that argument to get all the way mm. to God spans, not just all uh, possible worlds, but all logical possibilities. Um, again, you don't have to go that far for this argument. But, um, but I, and, and I just want to add, I don't, I, I actually think that the, the principle, that existential principle of, you can't deny something and then get a contradiction does have a counter example. So I think it's demonstrably false that that principle. Um, the example that I like to give is if you say that there are no truths, then that's going to entail that it is true that there are no truths, which entails that there is something that's true. So there are no truths is, you know, a negative existential. You're saying what there isn't, mm -hmm. then that entails that it's true. So it entails that there's something, a truth. Um, so, now that, that doesn't end this debate, but you know, like you said, we're in deep, deep waters of controversy. And I think maybe to your original point, if somebody just asserts uh, one side or the other without going through the weeds of this controversy, then I think it would be question begging, right? Because hmm. you've got to say more. You can't just say, well, you know, there's no contradiction here, or it's it's logically possible that God doesn't exist, or it's metaphysically possible that God doesn't exist, or that it's logically possible that God does or metaphysically possible that God does without some additional argument. And that's actually what's on the table is an argument. That's what we're looking at, an argument for this conclusion. Well, I'm amazed that we actually, it looks like we didn't lose too many audience members while we went on that digression. Yeah, so let's get into the they next clip. The, they, they followed us into the waters, the deeper waters. Okay. So uh, we're talking that the next clip is basically just more on definitions of terms which is the most exciting thing that can ever happen in philosophy. So here we go. Uh, well, I would say that what you have been saying uh, brings us back, it seems to me, to the ontological argument that there is a being whose essence involves existence so that his existence is analytic. That seems to me to be impossible. And uh, it raises, of course, the question, what one means by existence? Uh, and as to this, I think a subject named uh, 
can never be significantly said to exist, but only a subject described. And that existence, in fact, quite definitely, is not a predicate. Well, you say, I believe, that it is bad grammar, or rather bad syntax, to say, for example, T.S. Eliot exists. One ought to say, for example, the author of Murder in the Cathedral exists. Are you going to say that the proposition, the cause of the world exists, is without meaning? You may say that the world has no cause, but I fail to see how you can say that the proposition that the cause of the world exists is meaningless. Put it in the form of a question. Has the world a cause, or does a cause of the world exist? Most people surely would understand the question, even if they don't agree about the answer. So it sounds like, to me, that they're starting at this point to talk talk past each other a little bit. Yeah, it, it seems like I have a, a number of notes. I'm not going to go through all my notes on this. Just it, it seems like they're kind of shifting now to um, this. And this is where Russell deeper. is taking it, right? Russell takes it to this Kantian objection about existence, not predicate. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, it, there's this objection that the cosmological argument sort of ultimately depends on an ontological argument. An ontological argument tries to show that God exists by pure reason. And, well, if a cosmological argument tries to show that there is a necessary thing, and if a necessary thing is, by definition, something that can be shown to exist by pure reason, then you might think that a cosmological argument can only be sound if an ontological argument is also sound. Now, one thing that's interesting here dialectically is that you can believe that an ontological argument is sound by believing a cosmological argument is sound if you accept that necessary existence requires deducibility through truths of reason, which Coppelson isn't taking that path. But it's just, it's worth pointing out that there's a distinction here between the soundness of an argument and your reason for believing that it's sound. So it might be that a problem with the ontological argument is that, at least in, in the, the form in question, is that you, you can't really see by reason that there's this necessary thing. Uh, you need to see by experience that something exists, and then by reason, that in order for something to exist, to exist, there has to be a necessary thing. So in other words, you're using reason and experience to come to the conclusion that there's something that can be known by pure reason, even if you don't yourself see how to know it by pure reason. Like, like maybe God knows it by pure reason, or you know, <laughs> you don't have to know it by pure reason for it to be knowable by pure reason. And it's through the cosmological argument that you can show that there is such a thing. But what you said there, Cameron, about maybe talking past each other, I think perhaps that's right because now what I think Coppelson is doing is he's kind of moving toward that more modest result that he's talking about um, something that's self-existent um, and then everything else depends on the self-existent thing. And, you know, that's why he says, like, don't you, can you understand what it means for these things to have an explanation, um, to have a cause? And we don't have to get caught into this thing about defining necessity in ter terms of truths of reason in order to think about whether there is something that is self-existent and at the root of everything else. And that's kind of what he needs. That's kind of all he needs for the main conclusions he's going to draw out from the argument, which is that there's something that transcends the objects that we sort of perceive. The perceivable objects don't contain within themselves the reason for their existence. So there's a transcendent thing that is not perceivable with our senses. Um, and it's sort of the root of, of the rest of reality. Uh, I mean, of course, there's still a question like, you know, is that God? Should we even call that God? Um, and I think it's actually helpful maybe that they're not even getting into that because then they're looking at these kind of more basic fundamental metaphysical questions about the nature of this, this root of reality. But yeah, so it does seem like there's a little bit of maybe kind of being at odds and how they're defining things at this point. Um, but then this is going yeah. to lead them next into this discussion of, okay, what is, can you get an ultimate explanation of explained things? So they're going to talk about that next. Yeah. And so to me, it sounds like, or it seems, it seems, and we're going to see this at the very end too, their closing clip is that the, the disagreement between the two of them ultimately comes down to a disagreement over terms and it's it's kind of un, you know anticlimactic, but sometimes that's what happens in philosophy. Um, and that that isn't to say again that that progress can't happen. It's just that these conversations are necessary, but sometimes they're not super exciting. But you've got to be able to do this when you're doing philosophy is be able to get down and in, into the weeds here. And I think 
what happened is Russell uh, was sort of, you know, asserting his view of necessity and then Copleston wanted to find ways of like getting around it. Uh, maybe we can get back to the argument. Maybe I can concede these things and then still run my argument without getting into a debate over semantics. But then eventually the two of them uh, realize that they've got to have this this discussion, this semantic discussion over definition of terms before they can even make any progress. And then in the end, they end up not making too much progress at all. But yeah, so I think that it may be helpful to to sort of understand the the sort of broader context of what's going on. It's really a big conversation about definition of necessity. So, all right, here we go. Here's the next clip where they talk more about the definition of necessary existence. Certainly, the question, does the cause of the world exist, is a question that has meaning. But if you say, yes, God is the cause of the world, where you're using God as a proper name, then God exists it will not be a statement that has meaning. That is the position that I'm maintaining. <coughs> because, and therefore, it will follow that it cannot be an analytic proposition uh, ever to say that this or that exists. And take, for example, suppose you take as your subject the existent round square. It would look like an analytic proposition that the existent round square exists. But it doesn't exist. No, it doesn't. Then surely you can't say it doesn't exist unless you have a conception of what existence is. As to the phrase, existent round square, I should say that it has no meaning at all. I quite agree. Then I should say the same thing in another context in reference to a necessary being. Well, we seem to have arrived at an impasse. To say that a necessary being is a being that must exist and cannot not exist has for me a definite meaning. For you, it has no meaning. Well, we can press the point a little, I think. A being that must exist and cannot not exist would surely, according to you, be a being whose essence involves existence. Yes, a being the essence of which is to exist. But I should not be willing to argue the existence of God simply from the idea of his essence, because I don't think we have any clear intuition of God's essence as yet. I think we have to argue from the world of experience to God. Yes, I quite see the distinction. But at the same time, for a being with sufficient knowledge, it would be true to say, here is this being whose essence involves existence. Yes, certainly, if anybody saw God, he would see that God must exist. So that, I mean, there is a being whose essence involves existence, although we don't know that essence. We only know there is such a being. Yes, I should add, we don't know the essence a priori. It is only true a posteriori through our experience of the world, that we come to a knowledge of the existence of that being. And then one argues, the essence and existence must be identical. Because if God's essence and God's existence were not identical, then some sufficient reason for this existence would have to be found beyond God. So first they start talking, Russell's objection is that, you know, God could be like the concept of a square circle. And then Copleston kind of comes back on that, but then they turn the conversation over to, uh, I just, I just lost my train of thought, but yeah, let's start, start, start us off on this, uh, this whole square circle thing, because I think that might actually help clarify. Yeah. This goes back to the concept of that sort of analytic truth where you can just sort of see from the concept of something included in the concept or some other properties. And, uh, you know, the worry is that you can't deduce sort of whether the concept applies to reality just by seeing what other concepts or properties are teased out of that concept itself. And so this again goes back to this basic worry that Russell has that in principle, you can't just use reason to deduce the existence of something. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel like what Coppelson really has is he kind of has two lines going at once in his response. One line is to kind of pull away from this understanding of necessity as deducible from reason, where he's just saying, no, there's something that at the root of reality that has self-existence and it explains everything else. But then the other thing that's kind of going on uh, is that what Copleson is pointing to is that um, even if I can't see by reason why God's nature would have to be applied to reality um, just by considering God's nature, I don't have that kind of insight. It doesn't mean that there isn't that kind of a nature or that I don't have a good reason to think that there is that kind of a nature. 
a nature whose essence involves mm. its existence. Um, one way of I, I've thought about clarifying that is it's an essence that has itself an essential property of being instantiated in all worlds. Okay, and and, um, and so maybe I can't just see by considering the essence of God that it has that uh, property, um, but I can see by the cosmological argument that there needs to be uh, an essence that has that property um, as an ultimate explanation of everything else. So that, that's kind of my summary of, of what's going on there. And yeah, this is really my, my own work, my own thinking, because when I wrote my book, How Reason Can Lead a God, I was thinking a lot about God's relationship to logic. And on my chapter, The, the Foundation of Reason, I make this argument that God spans all the worlds in which logical truths exist. And that, that would make God as necessary as logical truths, uh, because he, 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 he spans all the worlds where there are logical truths. Um, and I remember like I was just like in my kitchen, like just thinking, thinking, thinking about this, because I thought, well, does that mean that uh, I can deduce that God exists from the logical truths? Um, and it's like, well, <laughs> whether I can or, I, or not, like whether I personally can do it or not, does nothing to undermine an argument from explanation that says everything else is explained in terms of this ultimate thing. And so there would be a thing like that. In this chapter, I'm thinking here of, of um, God providing a kind of house or explanation or home for logic itself. And so I can have an argument from explanation for the, the instantiation of that essence, even if I don't myself have insight into the essence directly, if that mm. makes sense. So, yeah, the way that I see all of this interacting, uh, it, it kind of ties us back into the very opening of this, where the way that Copleston responded to, or really the way that Russell responded to Copleston's opening was to target his conclusion as opposed to target yes. one of the premises. And so he yeah. basically says, you know, there can't be anything of that sort because the way that we understand necessity is in this really strict way of like what the truths of reason tell us. Yeah. And so he's objecting to the conclusion of the argument without objecting to any specific premise of the argument. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of the point that you just made here as well. Is it like, well, okay, that's, you know, that's a separate question and we can kind of shelf that for now, but then we've still got this argument that leads to this conclusion. Uh, but then obviously there's other things that could be said about the definition of necessity, whether or not yeah. the analytic synthetic distinction is the, the right place to draw the, not, the line between what's possible and what's impossible. So yeah, I think it, it kind of ties us back into the very beginning, how, how this all got started. Yeah, and not just analytic synthetic, but also um, just truths of reason versus, uh, you know, some other other truths, empirical truths. Um, but yeah, so I think that's all that I have on, on that part. Hmm. Okay, all right, well, let's get into the, uh, the next clip. Next one is uh, they kind of shift gears and start talking about the principle of sufficient reason. So this one... Uh, is a great clip. So uh, a lot more back and forth. Here we go. It all turns on this question of sufficient reason. And uh, I must say, you haven't defined sufficient reason in a way that I can understand. What do you mean by sufficient reason? You don't mean cause. Not necessarily. Cause is a kind of sufficient reason. Only contingent being can have a cause. God is his own sufficient reason. But he is not cause of himself. By sufficient reason in the full sense, I mean an explanation adequate for the existence of some particular being. But when is an explanation adequate? Suppose I am about to make a flame with a match. You may say that the adequate explanation of that is that I rub it on the box. Well, for practical purposes, but theoretically that's only a partial explanation. An adequate explanation must ultimately be a total explanation to which nothing further can be added. Then I can only say you're looking for something which can't be got and which one ought not to expect to get. To say that one has not found it is one thing. To say that one should not look for it seems to me rather dogmatic. What I'm doing is to look for the reason, in this case the, in this case the cause, of the objects, the real or imagined totality of which constitute what we call the universe. You say, I think, that the universe, or my existence if you prefer, or any other existence, is unintelligible. I shouldn't say unintelligible. I think it is without explanation. Intelligible, to my mind, is a different thing. 
Intelligible has to do with the thing itself, intrinsically, and not with its relations. Well, my point is that what we call the world is intrinsically unintelligible apart from the existence of God. You see, I don't believe that the infinity of the series of events, I mean a horizontal uh, series, so to speak, if such an infinity could be proved, would be in the slightest degree relevant to the situation. If you add up chocolates, you get chocolates after all, and not a sheep. If you add up chocolates to infinity, you presumably get an infinite number of chocolates. So if you add up contingent being to infinity, you still get contingent beings, not a necessary being. An infinite series of contingent beings would be, to my way of thinking, as unable to cause itself as one contingent being. However, you say, I think, that it is illegitimate to raise the question of what will explain the existence of any particular object. It's quite all right if you mean by explaining it, simply finding a cause for it. Well, why stop at one particular object? Why shouldn't one raise the question of the cause of the existence of all particular objects? Because I see no reason to think there is any. The whole concept of cause is one we derive from our observation of particular things. I see no reason whatsoever to suppose that the total has any cause whatsoever. So tell us what happened in this clip. Yeah, well, here I feel like they are making progress. You know, you, you noted earlier, Cameron, that it seemed like maybe by the end they don't make progress in defining their terms. And I think that they kind of throw up a bunch of different concepts that need to be teased out. And I had that in my notes as well. I think to make progress, they need to now give explicit definitions of their terms um, because there's a lot of different concepts on the table there. But here I think they are making progress by getting more to the, the root of the argument which isn't even so much, I think, about necessity, but about um, having an explanation within itself versus an explanation uh, within something else. And I wrote my summary of uh, Copleston's basic argument here. So his argument is that the series of dependent things or events is either caused or not caused, okay, or explained. Um, if it's caused or explained, then something independent exists beyond the series uh, if it's caused. If it's uncaused, then the series itself is independent. And um, but no sense, but no series of dependent events can itself be independent. This is kind of one of his theme principles here is that you can't take chocolates and add them up to a sheep. You know, you take chocolate. I love that analogy. It's like, you know, a whole universe of chocolate is still chocolate, right? Similarly, saying a whole universe of dependent things is still dependent things. And I think embedded in this principle is a kind of principle of sufficient reason or explanation, which is that uh, there has to be some explanation of these things. But adding up things that are dependent and have some explanation doesn't yield a totality that is itself independent. But if it were independent, well, then it would itself be the thing that has a reason for its own existence. So it's kind of like either way, you're going to arrive at something that has a reason for its own existence um, there. You know, Cameron, I, I, I don't know if, if I accidentally jumped ahead here because in my notes, I have Russell's fallacy of composition worry. I don't know if that's actually. Yeah, we next. haven't we haven't yeah. played that that one yet. Yeah, yeah we uh, we're, we're about to get to that one. Why don't I just go ahead and play it? Yeah. We've already go been ahead. going for about an hour and a half, so yeah. I'll just play that one. And then uh, we'll probably play the closing clip that we've got set up right after that Sounds one great. as well. And then we'll uh, we'll pro provide our, our closing comments. Okay, so yeah, here's the second to last clip. I can illustrate what seems to me to be your fallacy. Every man who exists has a mother. And it seems to be your argument is, therefore the human race must have a mother. But obviously the human race hasn't a mother. That's a different logical sphere. Well, I can't really see parity. If I was saying every object has a phenomenal cause, therefore the whole series has a phenomenal cause, there would be a parity. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying every object has a phenomenal cause, if you insist on the infinity of the series, but the series of phenomenal causes is an insufficient explanation of the series. Therefore, the series has not a phenomenal cause, but a transcendent cause. Well, that's always assuming that not only every particular thing in the world, but the world as a whole, must have a cause. 
For that assumption, I see no ground whatever. If you'll give me a ground, I'll listen to it. Well, the series of events is either caused or it's not caused. If it is caused, there must obviously be a cause outside the series. If it's not caused, then it's sufficient to itself. And if it's sufficient to itself, it is what I call necessary. But it can't be necessary, since each member is contingent. And we've agreed that the total is no reality apart from the members. Therefore, it can't be necessary. And I should like to observe in passing that the statement that the world is simply there and is inexplicable can't be got out of logical analysis. I cannot see how science could be conducted on any other assumption than that of order and intelligibility in nature. The physicist presupposes, at least tacitly, that there is some sense in investigating nature and looking for the causes of events, just as the detective presupposes that there is some sense in looking for the cause of a murder. The metaphysician assumes that there is sense in looking for the reason or cause of phenomena. And not being a Kantian, I consider that the metaphysician is as justified in his assumption as the physicist. When Sartre, for example, says the world is gratuitous, I think that he hasn't sufficiently considered what is implied by gratuitous. I think there seems to be a certain unwarrantable extension here. The physicist looks for causes. That does not necessarily imply that there are causes everywhere. A man may look for gold without assuming that there is gold everywhere. If he finds gold, well and good. If he doesn't, he's had bad luck. The same is true with the physicists look for causes. As for Sartre, I don't profess to know what he means, and I shouldn't like to be thought to interpret him. But for my part, I do think the notion of the world having an explanation is a mistake. I don't see why one should expect it to have. Okay, so w was the the argument that you gave, yeah. was it... It was a summary of Coppelson's response here to the charge of the fallacy the of composition. Um, so in the previous clip, kind of what's at work now, what's surfacing, is a kind of principle of explanation or principle of sufficient reason that Coppelson is using to argue that dependent things have to be explained ultimately in terms of something else beyond them. Something then that has an explanation within its own nature or within itself. And so, you know, Russell is asking, well, you know, why think that? Why think that things uh, have to have an explanation? And furthermore, why think that the total of things that do have an explanation would itself have to have an explanation? Just like, you know, if every human has a mother, doesn't mean that humanity in its totality has a mother. So it'd be like a fallacy to assume that the whole has all the properties of the parts. Um, and Coppelson seems to be committing this fallacy um, of assuming then that the whole of dependent things is itself dependent. And so Coppelson's response there, which I began to preview previously, was that, I mean, look, either the series of dependent things is caused or not caused. Well, if it is caused, then the, you, you basically get Coppelson's argument. Then there's something independent beyond the series. If it's not caused, well, then the series itself is independent. And so it would have to have the sufficient reason within its own nature for its existence. But then this contradicts this kind of key premise, which is that dependent things don't add up to independent things. This is, you know, the chocolates don't add up to sheep kind of a thing. And, you know, you might wonder, well, what's really, you know, is that the fallacy of composition right there? I think he is appealing to a kind of principle of explanation, even in this principle that um, merely putting together things specifically that have a reason in terms of something else or dependent things, putting these things together is not going to yield a totality that is fully explained internally. Um, it's going to have to be explained externally. And by the way, this is this precise principle is what William Rowe in his book on the cosmological argument ends up questioning. Uh, but then Rowe, it's interesting because he goes through this debate. I mean, this debate between Russell and Coppleston has continued to be mined and developed. And I see Rowe's discussion as a kind of further development. And what Rowe does is he develops Coppleston's line uh, without going through a fallacy of composition, but instead by appealing to a certain principle of explanation. And so I think this principle of explanation that contingent things, dependent things, whether one or many have a further explanation, that's like the key to unlock this argument. 
And that's exactly where Russell is then targeting that key there at the very end and saying, well, you know, scientists might look for explanations, might look for causes, just like somebody might look for gold. That doesn't mean that there always are causes. And I think that's kind of the right point to make there. You know, um, how do you know there's always a cause? There's always an explanation. And it's interesting, Cameron, because, you know, in the contemporary conversations about these arguments from Swinburne, for example, and I myself um, give these lines like this, where the, the one kind of response is to not say, to not insist that every thing, every dependent thing or every group of dependent things has to have an explanation or every contingent thing has to have an explanation, but rather to provide a kind of more modest principle that like other things being equal, take any thing, if it's contingent, it's going to have an explanation unless you have some special reason to think it doesn't. So it's, it's kind of like the presumption is to think there's probably an explanation. So like, even if you believe the stronger principle that every contingent thing or things has an explanation, um, you can run this argument in terms of a more, more modest principle that other things being equal for any given contingent thing or things, probably there's going to be some external explanation. And then you can use this to provide a kind of gentle reason and support of the conclusion that contingent things in total have a further explanation in terms of a necessary thing. And I kind of like that, that way of going. That's not what Copleston does um, here. Um, well, they kind of didn't get that far. I mean, this is kind of as far as they got in their exchange and setting it up. Yeah, so I want to talk more about one of the things that you mentioned here, which was this construction worry. I don't think you actually gave it that term, but there's the construction worry that's kind of going on beneath the argument here, which is like, you know, from a group of dependent things, can you get something that is independent? And it'll help to, I think, maybe use an analogy I've used in the past is like, if you fill your swimming pool with water, you're not going to suddenly get a pool made of fire, right? Because that's like, you've got a construction problem. You don't have the right parts in order to make the whole. And so you can make a similar kind of argument here. It's like, if you just add up a group of dependent things, then you're not going to automatically get a group of things that is independent. And the way that we can see this is the same kind of analogy that, that I just used with the pool is that like, take everything in my office, for example, the computer, the desk and the chairs and everything like suddenly at like adding up all of these things together into a group doesn't suddenly make it the case that my office exists independently. Right. And, and you can, that, that same exact thing applies to any group of dependent things that you can just think up, you know, uh, the, the, the group of things that make up Antarctica, right? It's not like that group is the group that exists independently. No, every single group of dependent things that you put together, like you can just see that. I think it's just, it's just obvious that you can't make an independent thing or plurality of things just by adding up a group of dependent things. So, and, and that is one way to support the argument from contingency that that might be kind of going on beneath the surface here, but yeah, I like how you it does that. interact with this, the composition worry. There's a related fallacy, I think. Uh, I don't know the term, the the name of it, but it's basically this fallacy that says like you can't say that the whole uh, has a different property than the parts, or like yeah, the, the, if the parts have a property, then the whole has got to have that property as well. Like that's mm -hmm. that's sort of a fallacy, right? So like, and that's that's kind of the fallacy of composition, yeah. I guess. The but think that it uh, always is the case, yeah. Right. But then back to what we just talked about, it's like there there are some cases like uh, an, another analogy you might use is that like a, a, a brick wall made of red bricks is going to have the property being red. Right. And so in some cases, like it depends. That, that's why I think it's a sort of case by case kind of thing. So like mm -hmm. depends on what you're talking about. But if if it's something like color, then the property color is what well, there is actually a term for this. You've used it in your book. It's uh, well, universally. Inherited whole inherited or like universally something so there's oh. some kind of fancy philosophical term I'm not, universally I'm not, I'm extended not. i don't know but yeah there's so there are some properties that go from parts to holes basically yeah so yeah. dependence is i think one of those properties like color yeah and i mean you could also be modest about this you, you might just think that well in general um you add up staplers you add up chocolate bars you add up water you're not going to get something that just exists 
independently, like in, on its own. Maybe theoretically there could be a counterexample of that, but for any given totality, um, you've got some reason. The presumption is to think that it has any given totality of dependent things. Of dependent things, right? That's right. Yeah, and so you might think, well, what about the totality of everything? You might think that's the special example uh, exception because there can't be something beyond everything. Okay, but that doesn't let us know whether the totality of everything uh, is solely consist consisting of dependent things. Like the whole point is that it, the totality of everything can't have an external explanation precisely if it has a independent foundational thing. I mean, that would sort of account for why it wouldn't have an external explanation. Um, yeah. Seems like I was going to add one more thing there, but don't quite remember. So I think we've yeah, covered this the, is, the ideas. I think this may highlight some of the advancements that have been made in the contemporary literature, I think, as a, like over, over and so. above the dialogue that we're that we're hearing here. Let me just play yes. the last clip and then we'll provide some kind of closing comments uh, to, to close us out for today. So, uh, and this one's pretty spicy. It's a, it's a great little clip, the way that they ended this. Here we go. Your general point then, Lord Russell, is that it's illegitimate even to ask the question of the cause of the world. Yes, that's my position. Well, if it's a question that for you has no meaning, it's of course very difficult to discuss it, isn't it? Yes. It is very difficult. I thought that was so great. <laughs> and it was good. I thought it was it was good. Like it was so it, obviously it was very clever of Coppelson to to put it that way. But then Russell's like, yeah, yeah, you're right. It is kind of it difficult. It is very difficult. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was a yeah. it was a perfect ending to this to this conversation. Then they're like, let's pass on to something else. <laughs> exactly. It's a perfect ending to this part of the conversation. Again, this is the back and forth that they had on the cosmological argument is just one part of a longer discussion they had. Yeah. But uh, I, thought, I, was, I, took it, it I took it kind of like, it, this is my interpretation. It's kind of like a speed chess and then they got to a draw position and Coppelson just said, well, you know, you're in this situation. You can't really do anything with that. You're in a difficult situation. And then Coppelson, and then Russell's like, yeah, yeah, it is difficult. And so it's like, well, then let's pass on to something else. And the handshake, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> that's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 But I think that, okay, so what are some overall thoughts of this dialogue? I know we, we kind of set up some things at the beginning of this and how there's still influence from this dialogue on the contemporary scene. But is there is this conversation completely invaluable now? Or invaluable is probably the wrong term. Is it, is it not valuable, valuable now? Yeah. Yeah, so it's still valuable now, right? And so why do you think that? Well, I mean, it's historically interesting. Um, when I wrote my dialogue book with Felipe Leon, uh, it's got the best explanation of things. In my first chapter, I go through a lot of the concepts in this discussion between Coppelson and Russell, but I don't actually, I, I, at least in my first draft, I didn't cite the Coppelson-Russell debate. And so one of the re reviewers had some comments and brought up the Russell, uh, the Russell Coppelson debate and wanted me to interact more specifically with Russell's concerns. And so that helped me to see that, okay, yeah, these concerns are, are in people's minds. Um, there has been more discussion. I mean, so there are, these things have been addressed and developed and clarified. They covered so much so quickly. And I feel like one of the big things, kind of like a big lesson or value of this conversation for me is just seeing the value of getting very clear on your terms. And this might feel mm -hmm. boring, it might feel tedious. To me, it's like cleaning your house. It's like, if when your house gets messy, it's harder to be happy, it's harder to be productive. And I don't know if you know that feeling where you just have a cleaning day and you just get everything clean and it's beautiful. And then the next morning, it's like you're anticipating what it felt like before, and but no, instead it's just beautiful and your soul is alive and you can just move around and breathe. And I feel like it's the same thing. You do the hard work. You, I feel like I can't overemphasize this because it's rare for people to do it. It's hard to do it. It's boring. It's tedious. I mean, it doesn't have to be boring. Um, but the fruit of it is that you clarify your thinking and your thinking becomes more beautiful. And when your thinking is more beautiful, you just have so much more power to understand so many other things. And in this debate, this conversation on the cosmological argument, they had to go, they had to dig into those terms um, to clarify the meanings of necessity and, and um, th those things in order to 
in order to work through those objections, to work through that. And so, yeah, I guess that would be kind of my big take home point is just, it's very valuable to think about what the issues they are bringing up and then work out, okay, what do I mean by necessary? What do I mean by contingent? You know, and then work out your argument or if you have an objection, work that out in terms of clear terms and that will that will help you. I've got one last question before we close it out. What is like your best steel man for Russell's position? So like what is the what is the the, the most charitable way uh, and draw on the contemporary literature as well. Like, what are, what is the most powerful way that this objection can be put today? Is it one of the ways that Swinburne puts it? Is it someone else or yeah, maybe your own formulation? Probably Swinburne's development of it would be, yeah, so something like this, um, that the concept of a necessary thing is going to include something that uh, has to be deducible by reason somehow and this is not the kind of thing that could be done like reason just doesn't have that power to deduce that so it, like it doesn't really matter you know, what your arguments are for the existence of this kind of a reality they can't work in principle because we already know there's something wrong um, at the outset we already know reason just doesn't have the power to reveal that there is that kind of a thing and then if you switch your terms so now you're talking not about a necessary thing, but a self-existent thing, then I think the sort of best um, strategy for somebody in Russell's position is to do exactly what Russell did, which is to question the the principle of explanation, the universal principle of explanation. Um, mm -hmm. it, it might be like the law of non-contradiction, right? Like, yeah, in general, there are no true contradictions, but maybe there could be some exceptions for various reasons. Similarly, here, you know, may, maybe maybe in general, the presumption is that there's an explanation, um, but there can be exceptions. And, you know, as Russell says, you know, I see no reason whatsoever to think that all of the dependent things has, has a further explanation. And so you sort of challenge it at that point, um, that principle of explanation. I think that, that, because I think that principle of explanation really is the key to the argument. So that, that would be the thing I think that one would, one would challenge. One last question I've got is back to this concept of like a necessary thing because i get i get sort of like once i start to think as deep as i can about some of these things it's just like it turns into mush i'm trying to like write every or yeah i'm trying to write things down in my head and it doesn't work uh so when i'm thinking about like the concept of a of a necessary being i want to say like i want to make the distinction that i made earlier between like what is a space of logical possibility and then yeah. it's a separate question of like you know what which, which propositions are true Mm -hmm. So, but in the case of, you know, a necessary thing, which again, or I, I haven't, I don't think I've mentioned this. I don't think you mentioned this, that God is not the only example of like a necessary thing. So this argument would not just apply to God. It would apply to any sort of metaphysically necessary thing or, or necessary thing more broadly that you'd want to spell out. So like platonic objects, a lot of Platonists think that numbers and possible worlds and propositions and everything are, are necessary in that sense. So it, this, this argument, if it works, it would basically mean that there are no necessary things like that. But, um, I guess I just, I don't even know what I'm trying to get at. It's just, it sort of turns to mush when I start to think of like the, the analytic, I don't know. I, I may just need time to, to think more about how to phrase this question, yeah. but I'm, I'm wanting, I'm wanting to get it. Yeah. I'm wanting, I'm wanting to get clear on like, because when you say that there's like a the concept of a necessary being, maybe this is one way to put it. So the concept of a necessary being doesn't entail that it's true that this necessary being exists to me, right? So if you just have the concept of something, like I've got the concept of uh, Harry Potter right now in my brain, but that doesn't entail that Harry Potter exists in reality, right? So just because you have a concept of something doesn't necessarily entail that that thing exists. It could be that, you know, this concept is a necessary being, but that necessary being just doesn't exist. It's false mm -hmm. that that necessary being exists. And so I guess that's what I'm trying to get at here is that it, it kind of confuses things for me when I think about it there. Like what what objection would they have to this idea that you can still make sense like internally of the concept of a necessary being, but it doesn't entail, you know, that this necessary being exists for that you need to turn to other arguments. Maybe that's where the argument from contingency would come in. So I guess yeah. the distinction that I'm trying to make is between the coherence of a concept of something 
versus whether or not that concept exists in reality. It applies to reality. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and even there, I think that, um, again, that this distinction between the internal coherence of a concept mm -hmm. and then it's um, whether it, it might have entailments sort of out of sight. Because let's see if I can get this into my mind. The concept of being a property. Um, you might think that just by reason, um, just by reason, you, you once you understand the concept of being a property, you can see that that property would have the property of being a property. You might think that you can see this just by reason. Um, well, in that case, what you've just done here is you've argued from reason that the concept of being a property actually applies to reality because um, the concept of being a property is um, exemplified in actual reality by itself in this case being a property is exemplified by itself now this how is kind that, of a, how does that work because i don't see that well because okay let me see um so the whole question is how can you go from the concept of something to its application mm -hmm. um so i, I was also kind of getting at as you're thinking yeah. through that i was kind of getting at this idea that it doesn't necessarily because i think that's kind of the worry here is that like Someone might be like the, the Kantian objection is like, you can't just argue that this being exists in reality. Like you can't just like yeah. say that it exists. Right. So what I want to say is that there's a difference between like the internal coherence of a thing and whether or not that thing exists in reality. So there it might be the case that a necessary being is a completely coherent concept. But then it's it's, it's a separate yeah. step, a different step. Something, you know, you move away from the concept then start to talk about whether or not this thing exists in reality. And that's where you yeah. want to introduce different arguments and stuff. So I almost want to just kind of like sidestep this concern that might be behind the analytic distinction that yeah. Russell was talking about and that we see from Richard Swinburne. It's like, no, we're not assuming that God exists at this point. We're just talking about the concept of a necessary being. And it doesn't really seem like there's anything internally problematic with that. Uh, unless you've got some argument that it's that there is some kind of internal incoherence in that concept. Yeah. So that's that's kind of my point is that I, I want to yeah. make the distinction between the internal coherence of a thing and the truth or whether or not that thing actually exists as a way of putting away the worry that we're just assuming that this being exists in reality. Yeah. It could be that, yeah. you know, you've got this concept of a necessary thing, but maybe there just are none of those things that exist. And so it's it's still a coherent thing, right? It's still a coherent idea or concept, but it's a separate question whether or not there are any of those things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That that's a good way to put it. I think maybe the, a better way to put my thought was just that there's sort of three things going on here. There's the internal coherence of the concept, and then there are these sort of maybe two different strategies for arguing that um, the concept applies to reality. One is through reason. The other is through empirical tracks um, through observation and um, I guess in my own mind both paths are open paths um, and then that's consistent with your point which is that um, you can separate the paths from the internal coherency of the concept mm -hmm. itself yeah which I mean yeah. that that doesn't necessarily mean that you know someone isn't going to find a problem with the the internal coherency of of these things that we're talking about, these necessary beings. And go, go, going back to like Richard Swinburne, you know, he's got this argument. So if that argument sound, then it does show that there it, there's something incoherent or something wrong with the concept mm -hmm. itself. But I, I just think that that's important to make that distinction. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so is there is there anything that you would like to, to leave us with? We did get an interesting question from Real Atheology, but it might take us down a rabbit trail. Do you have much time? I have a little bit of time. That would be fine. Um, I don't really have anything else. I think I covered everything just looking at my notes here. Okay. Um, I had the secret argument at the end. I don't know. Maybe we won't talk about that this time, but probably not. Yeah, we we've got a, a little bit. Yeah. Or we've we've gone a little bit longer than I was anticipating. Yeah. So let's just uh, let's address uh, just a couple of these questions then. 
So the first one that we got a while back was from Maverick Christian. And he says, for, your, for Dr. Josh Rasmussen, do you pronounce Copleston, Copleston or Copleston? <laughs> I pronounce it Copleston, but maybe it should be pronounced Copleston. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm not a good person to ask. On this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pronu- who should we be asking? Dr. Craig? Yeah, I don't know. He would know. <laughs> he kind of knows like how to pronounce everything correctly. It's weird. My first thought is I need to ask my Super wife. Skill. She's the one who knows language. So, Couple, he would, Dr. Craig would probably like <laughs> pronunciate it, you know, in French or Pronounce. something. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually pronounced Cooper. Okay. So, uh, all right. Here's another. Is this, this was a super chat and same one from, from Wade. So, thank you guys for sending these in. He says, uh, if God can be said to have no reason for existence, mm-hmm. can Russell actually take the win that the absence of reason? does have action. I don't know what he means by that last part. So maybe, because maybe what Russell can say, I mean, this is kind of a standard worry. You know, if if God has no reason for its existence, then why can't the universe, which isn't God, have no reason for its existence, right? Um, I think what Copleston or Copleston is going to say here is that, Mm -hmm. well, everything has a reason for its existence, either within its nature or within some uh, something else. Um, so I think, so Cobbleson won't even take this line. He'll just say, no, God does have a reason for God's existence because God is the kind of being that exists in a self-existent way, um, precisely because God has necessary existence, you might say, or because God's existence is identical to his essence. It seemed like Cobbleson wanted to say something like that or involves, let's see, the essence involves existence. I think that was the idea. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think this gets at the, I think one of the most profound questions that you can ask in philosophy of religion, and maybe that just means that I haven't asked enough questions, but one of the most profound questions that I've come across is this question of like, what is the difference between the caused and the uncaused? And so some people want to say that God is the difference. Other people want to say that you can stop at, say, the universe. So I think that once you answer that question, it's actually going to have a pretty big impact on your worldview. So I, I just think this is a great question. I think everybody needs to ask it. And once you get some clarity on that, it might actually have some implications into your uh, your overall worldview. So If I could just add one more thing, because this is really just a beautiful question, and it is so important. Um, one thing I've been actually kind of thinking about this recently, it's like even if you say that the ultimate reality has necessary existence, and therefore it doesn't have a further explanation beyond itself, its reason is within it, you can still ask yourself, okay, well, what kind of reality could be fundamental and have necessary existence? And you can just actually check in your mind, like, could it be blue? Like, could fundamental reality be like just this blue field? It's just fundamentally blue. You might think, well, no, blue is not a relevant, relevantly different thing to just exist uncaused. It's, it's like not the kind of thing to have necessary mm-hmm. existence. So the point is like merely saying that it even has necessary existence doesn't even sort of end the quest to find to fill out its nature. You know, is it triangular? Like what what could it be? What could be necessary and fundamental? And this is, I think, yes, one of the most profound questions anybody can ask. It's a powerful question. I think it can lead you into more insight. Yeah. I, I would I want to just you can use that it can't be a turtle. You can know the fundamental reality is not a, a turtle through this. You know what, Josh? This is what we need to do. Just just made it up in my mind. We need to do a stream and the title of it is the most profound question you can ask something like that. Yeah. And then we'll just talk about that. That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we've got some questions from real atheology, our friends over at real atheology. They're some of my best friends when it comes to philosophy, religion, and the whole like theist, theist, atheist divide these two different views and reality. The reason why is because they take philosophy seriously. A lot of atheists simply don't take as philosophy as seriously as they should but the guys at Real Life Theology do. And so uh, you'll, you'll see it in these questions that they ask here. So uh, this is the first one. Could Dr. Josh Rasmussen talk about what the most formidable objections to contingency arguments are today and historically, such as those by Quentin Smith, J. Howard Sobel, Graham Oppie, et cetera? Yeah. So I would say, you know, it's difficult because there are different forms of the argument. Um, one objection that I've seen that's in common between Sobel and Oppie is to challenge this, um, well, 
Now I'm thinking, Oppie's sort of interesting character because he's got uh, an article in Noose where he challenges contingency arguments for a necessary thing. But then Oppie himself ends up uh, offering a reason to think that there's a necessary initial item to account for modal uh, truths about possibility. Um, so now I'm having to separate different objections in my mind. But one kind of objection that comes up is targeting exactly what Russell targeted, which is the principle of um, the, the general principle of explanation. So again, there are different arguments from contingency. But one kind of argument appeals to a kind of general principle of explanation, that every contingent fact has an explanation. And one type of response is to challenge that general principle. Um, you know, the most formidable arguments against that principle, I would say, are arguments that try to show that that principle itself is so strong that it actually has intolerable consequences. Like, um, it implies that everything is necessary because in order for Nessar reality to explain contingent reality, the link between the Nessar reality and contingent reality would itself have to be explained. And either you go off to an infinite regress or you have a kind of explanation that actually really breaks the contingency of the explanandum of, of that which is explained. So there's that kind of an argument. Um, so I, I guess I would say that that principle of explanation is such a key in these kinds of arguments. So the best kind of objection to the arguments would target that principle of explanation. Um, another kind of response would focus more on the identification stage of the argument and say, look, I mean, even if you get a necessary fundamental reality, you know, why think this fundamental reality has a supreme nature? You know, why think it has intelligence? Why think it would be God in, in any sense? Um, why believe that? And I think that's an important kind of objection or question it does lead us to a further inquiry into what are you know called the stage two cosmological arguments um i'm trying to think you know if, if there's a particular objection in my own mind that like causes causes my my own mind to suffer when i think of the objection it well makes me let uncertain. me mention this yeah. at least is that in your book with uh, alexander proust called necessary existence you cover a, a lot of the standard objections to yeah. contingency arguments, and uh, that that is one of the you develop a modal contingency argument, but that argument is developed in the book, and you basically argue that there is a necessary thing. But uh, the reason why I mention that is because you do address a lot of these objections in your published work. So if you're interested in this kind of question, as Josh Josh is thinking through some of these, then go check out his uh, his published work. He's got a book, How Reason Can Lead to God. That one is one of my favorite books ever. Got to read it. Uh, Necessary Existence with Alex Proust, co-wrote co it together with him. Uh, definitely check out both of those resources if you want more, you want to get deeper into these these two arguments. So is, are there any other objections you want to mention? If I could just add, maybe, maybe a, a way that I would propose to provide the kind of most strategic response to any of these kinds of arguments, it would be to do what Graham Oppie does very nicely, which is to just develop... Uh, an ontology uh, that explains the causal and explanatory structure of reality um, in terms that don't appeal to any kind of supreme or intelligent foundation. And I think that's almost like better than coming up with an objection to an argument. It's kind of an implicit objection. It's a way of saying, here's, here's a consistent ontology. There's nothing in your argument that shows a problem with this theory. Um, and in fact, I would say like in general, the way the conversations have, have turned these days, it seems to me that they've kind of turned into um, talking about costs and benefits of different theories. And, and I think that's kind of maybe a helpful way to go. Um, it's kind of a scientific way of going. Here's a theory, yeah. here are the costs and benefits. They've got another question, so I'll put that one on the screen and then we'll close it out. So they said, also, what do you think caused the shift from leading defenders of atheism like J.L. Mackey and J.H. Sobel rejecting the idea of a necessary being to now people like Graham Oppie accepting it? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's fun to like come up with this story. You know, we could say, well, the arguments yeah. for necessary being are now sort of overwhelming and um, 
So now the, the well, I mean, Rob Coons really- is also another person I, I've talked with, and he he mentions the shift as well. Is that there there is this kind of shift moving right now from the sort of Russellian Russell Russellian idea of like you know objecting to the idea of a of a necessary being. They've kind of shifted in the academic at least m- m- the majority of it has shifted over to this acceptance of sort of the stage one of the contingency arguments that gets you to a necessary being stage two is where now the the most pushback is happening so they're saying that no okay even if there is a necessary item or necessary foundation doesn't follow that this necessary thing is god or perfect or anything other than the universe yeah maybe i could add this there does seem to be a kind of progress and an intellectual Mm -hmm. progress from first questioning whether the concept of necessity can even be applied to a thing rather than to a proposition. And then it seems like the development of modal logic has helped us to move past that because now we can state, we can actually translate talk about necessary things in terms of talk about necessary propositions. And we have a logic that allows us to spell this out very clearly and precisely. So in, in my impression is that philosophers have moved away from this sort of semantic debate or this category problem and then the next stage of the debate was about whether there actually is a necessary thing. And it's also kind of interesting, Cameron, because I think about the psychology of these debates. Um, I think sometimes you have to be careful. If, <laughs> people like to sort of find their own path. So like Graham Oppie, his argument like wasn't one of the arguments that are sort of standard cosmological arguments. He gives a nice argument for a necessary thing. Um, and so he develops that. And then I think because he, he almost make, makes it safe in a way now for people to say, oh, yeah, okay, well, whether God exists or not, here's a causal structure of reality that's rooted in a basic necessary thing. Um, and so then that's that's a kind of progress in the discussion. Because, yes, it does seem like now there's a kind of turn towards the identification stage. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. you explain contingent reality in terms of a necessary foundation. Now what's the best account of its nature? And that's kind of an exciting development because now I feel like we can sort of be together as friends, as as truth seekers, trying to uncover reality together. Um, and and it seems like there's been progress made in that endeavor. Speaking of friends, I'm so excited to finally meet you in person at the uh, Capturing Christianity V1. Capturing Christianity, I didn't say that right. The, our first conference happening at the end of August 2021. Uh, which, by the way, there's still tickets available if you're interested in coming and seeing us in person. But uh, Josh Rasmussen is going to be there. He's given two different talks. Uh, one of them, one of the breakouts is on whether or not you're in a material or immaterial person, being, consciousness, whatever. It's uh, it's going to be super cool. I'm just, I'm so excited to finally meet you in person. I feel like we're, we're really good friends, you know, but I, I mainly see pixels and I hear your voice over these. Pixels. You know, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, over thank these, you. Uh, microphones and stuff. So, yeah, thank you. It'd be great to see you in person. I'll, I'll get to find out if you actually look the same. Like may, maybe you look very different. You know, I mean, because I have this hypothesis that what explains the visual data that I see through the screen somehow resembles your body, but maybe you're you're just like this green monster, just, and you look. So I'll find out. I'll find out when I when I see you. You will. You You'll find out. Uh, I'm actually only four foot eleven, so that's something you're gonna find out. Okay, <laughs> that's not true at all. But okay, uh, I, I, enough. We could we could talk forever. Thank you guys for tuning in today. I hope you got something out of this, and especially at the end when we we're just talking about contingency arguments more generally. Uh, let me know if you'd like to see a different dialogue on a different topic. I mentioned the one earlier about what is the most profound question that you can ask when it comes to philosophy or philosophy or religion. Uh, that'd be a fun stream to do. So let me know in the comments if you found value in this. And then if you'd like to see us do another dialogue together, but until next time, thanks Josh for coming on and I will see you guys the next capturing Christianity video. Hey, it's me again. Uh, Actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. 
Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?